Hi everybody, I am back from my brother's wedding and I'm ready to crank out some more videos. Um, before any of you even ask, because I'm sure some of you are curious, no, I didn't pull. I'm a software engineer. Don't assume such big things out of me. Um, additionally, I'm not too happy with how many subscribers I have. Only like 37 in the past few days. So uh, with that in mind, you guys better start subscribing quicker before I make some toolish videos and, you know, be the a millionth person on this app to be like, I work for Google. You guys need to lead code. And that's how I got my job. Because uh, apparently everyone does that now and uh, just gets a ton of views doing it with their with their day in their life videos and sipping their coffee and whatnot. So, you know, before this channel becomes into just like a, a view whoring system, let's let's get me some subscribers so I can feel better about myself. Okay, with uh, that pandering out of the way, let's get into uh, linearizability and ordering. Both are super important for understanding how consensus algorithms work, and that'll eventually segue us into understanding how real-life database systems work, and then we can talk about those, okay? Okay, let's talk about linearizability and ordering. So what is linearizability? Well, if you've heard the term used before, linearizability is the same as strong consistency. More formally, once an object is written on any replica, every single subsequent read will get that updated version of the object. There are no stale reads, and hence that means that object is going to be linearizable. Uh, just a quick note, don't confuse linearizability with serializability. Um, you can still have race conditions if you're trying to make multiple writes at once in like a transaction type of thing. For example, you know, if I have two writes and then my friend has two writes, they may be interleaved in a way such that one of my writes is going to win per se and be the most recent one, one of his is going to win per se and be the most recent one, and then our database is kind of in like a weird state, but um, you are still reading technically the most up-to-date write. Per object. So linearizability is only a guarantee per object, unlike anything to do with serializability or transactions. When is linearizability useful? Well, it's really useful when you want just one of something. Why? Because it means that you're going to get the most up-to-date value. So for example, um, if we have a lock, a distributed lock that you know is fault tolerant in the sense that it's replicated and there are a bunch of replicas saying here's who's currently holding the lock in the event that one node crashes, um, what we want is that we always want to get the most up-to-date value of which node is holding the lock. If this lock wasn't linearizable, what might happen is that um, you know one node might grab the lock, release it, and then a second mode, uh, node might grab the lock. And then if I want to read who's currently holding the lock, uh, a stale replica might tell me that the original node was still holding it, and that would obviously be a problem. Same thing goes for uniqueness constraints in a database. Um, if all the replicas are not, you know, in sync with one another at the right time, what might happen is, um, you know, I want to be golden shower lover 100, and I write that to replica 1, but then you write to replica 2, you want the same username, and my uh, username write has not been propagated to replica 2 yet, now we have a conflict. Okay, so what are the pros and cons of linearizability? Well, the pros are that we get strong consistency. Every single result that we get is up to date. We don't have to deal with stale reads. Um, we don't even have to you know, think about the possibility of them happening. The issue is that there's a huge performance hit. And uh, once we see how to implement linearizability, which is kind of strictly tied in with this idea of consensus, getting a bunch of nodes to agree on something, uh, this is going to make more sense. But for now, I'm just going to kind of keep linearizability and strong consistency as more of like a conceptual thing, and in subsequent videos, we'll go into how we actually might implement something like linearizability. Okay, so linearizability and ordering. So if we're going to act as if there's only one copy of the data, right? Every single replica has the same exact copy of the data, and any replica that makes a change, all those changes are instantly propagated. It means that there needs to be a total order of operations on the data. It means that every single replica, the state on it, can basically be expressed as an order of you know, writes that's occurred, and every single replica has to have the same exact ordering. Um, additionally, the fact that there's a total order means that every single operation is ordered. It's not a partial ordering where some operations you know, can be concurrent or have um, the same location in an ordering, they can't be compared, but rather total. Every single operation comes before another and after. Um, so this order is going to preserve causality. Um, we know that if one right is coming before another, that right is going to come before the other in the total order. Similarly, if writes A and B are concurrent, it doesn't really matter where A and B are with relation to each other in the total order. 
What matters more so is that every single replica has A and B in the same ordering relative to one another. Um, this is different than something like a causal ordering where you might actually just have a partial order of the operation that preserves causality. So I'm going to show that off in the next slide. So first, imagine we have five rights, um, A, B, C, D, and E. And so a total order might order them something like A, B, C, then D, then E. But let's say A and B were actually concurrent, which if you've watched my previous videos, you know the concurrent rights happen when two rights don't actually know about one another. You know, there's no happens before relationship. They just happen at the same time without actually knowing that each other ever existed. So imagine A and B happened at the same time and D and E happened at the same time. A partial order would say that A and B were incomparable. However, maybe C knows about both of them, so we know that C is greater than A and B. And similarly, if D and E were concurrent, we know that they might have uh, depended on C in order to happen, but they didn't know about each other. So the point is, you can express causality with just a partial ordering. Um, something like version vectors, which I've also covered in my multi-leader replication video, um, construct a partial order in the fact that there are some version vectors that can't be compared. They just tell you that two operations are concurrent. And, you know, in that case, you might create siblings or merge them somehow. But the point is that in a partial order, not all operations have to be compared. Whereas in a total order, even if operations are concurrent, you still have to put them in that order somehow. As you can see, though, in a partial ordering, what can happen is that, say, um, replica 1 does operation A, then B, and then replica 2 does operation B, then A. This might happen in something like, um, I don't know, a last right win scenario. Uh, What's going to happen is that these replicas are going to be in an inconsistent state. And so we can't have that because we said we want strong consistency, which means every replica has to have the same exact data. OK, so how do we create an ordering? Well, assuming we have something like single leader replication with no partitioning, so all writes are going through one node, well, we have a write ahead log, which is going to, just going to do this for us. However, this gets a lot more complicated in a scenario where there's leaderless or multi-leader replication. So we can go into that right now. Um, there are two ways of basically doing this, one which is called Lamport timestamps, which I'll cover in the next slide, and another is version vectors, which work as well, but they can also take a lot of space if there are a bunch of nodes. Okay, so as far as Lamport timestamps go, they are basically a tuple of two elements. So there's this concept of a counter, and then there's a node ID. And using this counter node ID combination, we can actually get a total ordering of the rights. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's imagine that the counter starts at one for every single client and database, and then um, each database has a node ID. So as you can see, we start off with two writes. Uh, the top client is going to write to the first replica, and the bottom client is going to write to the second replica. As you can see, their counters both start off with one. Okay, now in the subsequent operations, the bottom replica is going to be serving even more writes. Um, so now the counter is going to be incremented by one every single time because the bottom replica is getting new um, write operations. So now these operations are two comma two and three comma two. All makes sense so far. So now what's going to happen? The top client is now going to make yet another write. However, it's writing to the bottom replica. So what's going to happen is that instead of um, that write being numbered two comma two because um, the top client has only seen uh, counter one before. The second that the top client encounters um, a higher counter than its current one, so in this case it sees counter 3 on that second database, what it's going to do is actually uh, take its counter and take the maximum of what it's seen so far and the maximum counter on that replica. And as a result of that, it now is going to increment itself all the way to 4. Now finally, since it's going to keep its counter at 4, when it finally makes another write to replica 1, we're going to write um, with counter 5 to replica 1. Okay, so now to, to kind of summarize this, every single client in replica keeps track of the highest counter it's seen, and if it sees a higher one, it skips to that number. And then additionally, you might say, oh, wait, well, look at those first two operations. How do we order them if they have the same counter but different node IDs? All we do is just order the nodes somehow so that we can have an arbitrary tie-breaking order for the node IDs if the counters are the same. So our final order is going to be 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4, 2, and then 5, 1. We basically go by the counters, and if there are uh, two operations with the same counter, we use the tie-breaking node order. 
Okay, so what are the trade-offs of Lamport timestamps, especially when compared to version vectors, which I talked about in the past? Well, I started to touch on this, but Lamport timestamps take less space. It's just a two-element tuple, whereas version vectors are O of n. Why are they O of n? Well, it's n being the number of replicas, because every single replica has to keep track of its dependencies of um, basically uh, how up-to-date the other replicas are for a certain operation. So in that sense, since you have a vector um, with one element per replica, it takes linear space as opposed to constant space, and that's obviously a problem when you're sending things over the network. An advantage of version vectors, on the other hand, is that they can actually express concurrent operations since they're a partial ordering, whereas Lamport timestamps do not since they're a total order. By nature of the fact that Lamport timestamps are a total order, if we just look at that Lamport ordering, we don't actually know if two operations have a happens before relationship or they are concurrent. It's impossible to tell. So what happens when you have a total ordering is that you can have data loss. Um, one operation is basically arbitrarily kept over the, uh, another using that kind of node ordering. And additionally, that means that there's no ability to do things like custom merging or holding two rights as siblings. Another issue with Lamport timestamps is that they only provide us with the total order retroactively. So imagine me and my friend both want the username Fupa Sniffer 21 and we're making writes to different replicas concurrently. Even though the Lamport timestamps will eventually get those two replicas in a consistent state because, you know, they'll eventually get all of the writes propagated to them and they'll say, "Oh, you know, we know the ordering of each write and we can pick whether me or my friend gets that username." The fact that they don't get that Lamport timestamp in the moment means that both me and my friend are going to think that we had successful writes, and then eventually one of them is going to have to be rolled back, which is obviously problematic. Okay, so that leads us to total order broadcast. I mentioned that even though Lamport timestamps give us an ordering of the operation, it's not happening in real time, and as a result of that, it's not possible to actually go ahead and use this as a way to um, make linearizable storage. So as a result, we have this protocol called total order broadcast, which is basically saying this. If we have a bunch of you know, reads and writes, all of the messages indicating a read or a write operation need to be delivered to every single node without being lost, so no dropped messages. And additionally, the messages need to be delivered in the same order to every single node. And like I mentioned, that's just called total order broadcast. I haven't said how this would be implemented yet, but um, you know, this allows us to make linearizable storage, and I'll express how right now. So as far as writes go, you just go ahead and add them in the log, and obviously each write has to be sent to every single replica in the moment. They have to be performed in the same order, which is kind of why it's important that there are no dropped messages and they're sent in the same order. Um, and so, for example, you know, how does this work for a uniqueness constraint? Well, you know, first the database would perform the write for the first username because it gets them in the correct order. And then the database could see that any subsequent writes to a username are going to be violating that uniqueness constraint. As far as reads go, we want to make sure that we're actually getting strong consistency and not eventual consistency. The total order broadcast basically said that all the messages will be sent to every single replica in the right order and not be dropped. However, I never said anything about when they would get there. So for a read in particular, if you're making a read from a replica, you can't just go ahead and instantly read it the second there's a read request. Instead, we need to also add the read to this log of or, uh, operations that Total Order Broadcast is creating, and only once that replica gets to the read in the, in the log can it actually perform this read and make sure that everything is going to be up to date. Okay, so now let's quickly talk about consensus. Um, even though total order broadcast can be used to create linearizable storage, and also I didn't really touch upon this, but linearizable storage can easily be used to create total order broadcast because, you know, imagine we had linearizable storage and then um, I used basically like an atomic counter, and so that counter would be able to order every single operation um, on the database. So we could easily do it that way. We haven't actually said how to create either of these two things. Well. As it turns out, both of these problems are reducible to the consensus problem. The consensus problem being, how can we get a bunch of nodes with unreliable networks and nodes that might crash to generally agree on something and make sure to um, you know, come to a consistent state? So uh, in future videos, I'll discuss two or three ways of actually achieving consensus amongst nodes. 
and we'll see that there are definitely um, you know pros and cons amongst using consensus in your application where the biggest hit is definitely performance but sometimes you still need to be using it so in summary uh, as far as linearizability goes we're basically just acting as if there's one copy of the data amongst all the replicas known as strong consistency um, as far as ordering goes if there's no partitions and you can deal with a single leader for all of your writes, um, it's really easy to achieve something like total order broadcast. However, um, if you're using a multi-leader or leaderless configuration, you probably have to go ahead and use Lamport timestamps. Even still, Lamport timestamps don't actually solve our issue of creating linearizable or strongly consistent storage because they only order those operations retroactively. Uh, the messages aren't delivered in order to every single node but rather we can just order them after the fact, which is not sufficient for total order broadcast. And then finally, even though total order broadcast and linearizability are not the same, because total order broadcast doesn't actually say when those messages are gonna be delivered, you can use total order broadcast to achieve linearizability, and you can use linearizability to achieve total order broadcast. And then finally, if you can avoid having to deal with strong consistency, you probably just should. Oftentimes it's enough to have um, causally consistent data, which is basically saying if A happens before B, you should never be able to read B in a database unless you also be able to read A. Um, so I know that this video has been really theoretical for the most part, and you know there's not too much um, like actual content that you need to know other than the Lamport timestamp stuff. I consider this like a pretty solid primer for just like consensus in general because it's basically saying that if you really ever want to be achieving um, strong consistency, all the replicas have to go ahead and be receiving all of the operations in the same order, more or less at the same time, and to do so, this is a consensus problem. So we'll get into how we can achieve consensus in the next few videos, and again, this is still pretty theoretical and complicated stuff but it's important to know how to do, um, whether that's in a systems design interview or also possibly even just in your actual work.